Good afternoon, guys. Dr. Ken Nordberg again. <laughs> We're getting close to the opener. That's kind of exciting. Well, John and I have been busy packing. We're wondering how we're going to get everything up there. And the latest information is that by the end of next week, uh, before our hunting season begins on uh, Saturday the 7th, we could have 20 inches of new snow on the ground up there. So it's going to be kind of a <laughs> challenging hunt this year. We've had some of those before and did all right, but we'll see. We're kind of hoping it isn't going to be quite that much snow. Well, meanwhile, uh, I've got an important message to bring to you today concerning wolves. Especially you Minnesota hunters. Well, I have to say a few things for wolves in general all across the lower 48 states and maybe in Alaska as well. Uh, when, I grew, when I was a kid, Growing up on a farm up in north central Minnesota, wolves were hated by everyone. Didn't they? Farmers, because sometimes a wolf would kill a calf out in the pasture or some chickens in the yard or whatever, pigs. And back in those days there was a bounty on wolves. Actually on the on the, what was called the timber wolf then, the big ones, a seventy-five dollar bounty. And I actually trapped one when I was a teenager. And what a big thing that was for me to get $75 for that. But back in those days, we often heard wolves howl at night at a distance. So our farms, the Norberg farms were all adjacent to state land. And uh, the wolves inhabited that area forever, as long as I've known. But we rarely saw them. Uh, maybe see one wolf in one year, you know, something like that. It was, they were rarely seen. They were a, really a big problem where we lived. But yet, everybody hated wolves. <laughs> and uh, with the bounty system and trapping and snaring and hunting, uh, our wolves were re being reduced slowly. It took a long time for this to happen, uh, slowly in numbers until, when was it, 1974? The our wolves were added to the endangered species list of, of the Endangered Species Act. And that was about 45 years ago, 46, something like that. Well, since that time, the wolves have gradually increased in numbers in that part of our state, in the northern Minnesota, and other places as well. And starting about the year 2000, there was a, they were, our wolves in, in northeastern Minnesota were starting to spread. Their geographic range was enlarging. The reason being, there was no longer room for young wolves to find new ranges within that area. And in the next 10 years, they spread all the way through Minnesota, down even into Iowa down into Iowa, into the Dakotas, quite a few spread into the Dakotas, and quite a few spread into Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. And in our lifetime, in fact, the history of the United States, this kind of sudden increase in geographic range was something pretty unique. And of course, a lot of these wolves have ended up in places where people didn't want them to be. And farmers in northern Minnesota were losing livestock to the wolves and using all kinds of methods to try to keep the wolves away from their livestock. And the same all across northern Wisconsin and into upper Michigan and Dakotas. It was getting to the point where the wolves were again or becoming hated by everyone. This was terrible. It can't have that happen. Well, in 1990, I moved my family to a new hunting area, my, what I call my new uh, whitetail study area up near the Canadian border of Minnesota. And there was a number, well, there was a, there was a, a pair of wolves that denned within our study area. And so we saw these wolves quite often, you know, at a distance, sometimes up close. 
Uh, when we were bear hunting up there, they, we had wolves visiting our bait sites all the time because we had meat scraps in those, in those bait sites. And so we were seeing them up close. And, but all the while, as far as I was concerned, I was saying, they're potentially dangerous. And I'll never forget one morning. I, uh, I was using my stool, and, and one of the first years I was using my stool and, and deer hunting, and I was sitting in an area uh, where there was a browse area frequented by whitetails out in front of me, and I was downwind of it. And uh, I was watching this yearling doe out there feeding. And it was kind of a, you know, I wasn't interested in taking a doe. So I was just watching it, and, uh, and then I heard some grass rustling behind me, on my right. And thinking that was probably a deer, I turned my head real slowly and looked over there. And there were six gray wolves. Now let me tell you something. Gray wolves are big animals. You know, they're as tall as a yearling doe, about the same size as a yearling doe. That's a pretty good sized animal. They weigh up to 130 pounds. They're long-legged. One of the things I always remark when I see them, they look like they have really long legs. Now these wolves, uh, one of them was black, grizzled black, had little gray hairs in his fur. And uh, the, the other five, there were six of them, had grizzled black bodies, but they had tawny legs and muscles. You know, they're, they're, muscles were tiny. And I was thinking at the moment, you know, not a lot about that, but the, 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 the female wolf that damned on her range was tiny color, almost her whole entire body was all tiny. And the male was all black, and that, the one I was seeing here that was all black was that male. And as we were beginning to learn back in those years, you know, wolves aren't, they don't live in packs all year round. Uh, they form packs about the beginning of the fourth, uh, beginning of the second week in November each year where we hunt, about November 8th. It's almost like wolves have a calendar somewhere and it's, oh, it's time to form a pack. And seeing those younger wolves, or those other wolves with this black one, I was thinking they had to be progeny, you know, young of the two that lived on our range. And it turned out the two that lived on our range were the so-called alpha male and alpha female of the pack. They're the ones who decided what the pack was going to do. So that was all kind of interesting. But at this point, I looked at those and they were it was very strange what they were doing. They were walking back and forth, you know, no particular direction, sniffing the ground, wagging their tails, you know, tongues hanging out. For they, had, they didn't look one bit dangerous. But you know, I was thinking about a moose femur that I had found a few days earlier. You know, there wasn't much leaf, uh, meat left on it, and it was crushed. And uh, boy, wolves have a very strong, <laughs> they would have very strong jaws that can crush moose femur, femurs. And so I was thinking about that, and, and I was noticing while they were doing this, it was like they were searching for something they, the, that they dropped there earlier, and they wanted to find it. And uh, they were kind of happy about what they were doing, you know. <laughs> and there they were doing that, but I began to notice while they were moving this way and that, they were getting closer and closer and closer. And then the hair on the back of my neck started was <laughs> And then I turned and faced those wolves on my stool, and they just kept going. And finally, I decided I'm going to stand up and I'm going to cock my rifle just in case. So I stood up and to show them I'm bigger than they are. And that didn't make any difference. They just kept wagging their tails and getting closer and closer. You know, later my wife and I discovered this was a, tech, a wolf's technique for getting a, for taking a fawn. You know, the does commonly leave their fawns behind when they're young to go and feed them, and they come back, and 
wolves in our area, we learn later, were, ta were killing three or four of our fawns every year by November 1st. They were hauling wheels on our, on our fawns. And this is how, when they smelled one, and fawns are not, <laughs> they're not uh, without scent. They're not scentless. Everybody thinks they are. Mother licks them in there, so they're not scentless. But they have a lot of scent. And when a wolf smells a fawn, and they're single during the summer. Now the, the, that breeding pair is just a two of them on our, in our study area during the summer months. And then come November, then they form a pack. And that's kind of their headquarters where we, where we have our studying area. But anyway, that's the way a single wolf is able to take a fawn. The fawn will just lay there. Watch it, it's almost mesmerized. In fact, I was almost mesmerized by this action. And then when they get close enough, and Gene and I have seen this happen several times, they get closer and closer and finally jump on them, grab them by an ear or the neck, and bingo that. Well, you hear one little bleep from the fawn, and that's the end of the fawn. So that's how they, but I didn't know that then. So these wolves are getting closer. And you know, they're big, like I said, and they have yellow eyes. You know, none of them looked at me even once. They acted as if they didn't know I was there. But I knew they knew I was there because the wind was blowing toward them from me. They, they smelled me, no doubt about it. So what in the world were they up to? Well, I learned later what they were up to, but at this point I was thinking they're, they're after me. <laughs> And they got to a certain point, and I did something. I, at first, I thought, boy, that was dumb. But it, 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 I growled at them. Yeah, I went, Rrr. And when I did that, they all stopped immediately and looked at me with those yellow eyes. And they stared at me, and I, six big wolves stared at me. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they start walking this way, <laughs> wagging their tails and sniffing the ground. But now they were moving away. They weren't coming in. They moved to, off to my right, and pretty soon they were out of sight. And I sat down and thought about that, and I said, isn't that something? <laughs> I had grown at six big wolves, and they knew what I meant by my girl. I didn't want them any closer. And they walked away. They weren't frightened. They didn't act alarmed or anything. They just took their time. and disappeared. Well, it was a few minutes later, the wolves were gone, I was sitting there, and here comes that yearling doe, running as fast as it could, flat on it. It wasn't bounding, it was just trying to go as fast as it could, at, and without bounding really at all. And that, that, that tawny wolf was on its tail, staying real close, just coming as fast as he could. Now, it is hard for wolves, our wolves, to catch normal, healthy whitetails at our yearlings are older. Whitetails can outrun wolves, they're faster. And what makes it really, one reason that wolves seldom, oh, well, maybe one in five attempts will actually get a wolf when they hunt them and start something like this, a special t hunting technique that I'm talking to you about here. Uh, because, because White shells are faster and they can leap over obstacles. They can leap 25 feet when they get going, jump eight feet in the air, they go over things that wolves have to go around. They can't jump like a, a deer can. And so uh, white tails can out, outrun wolves. Usually wolves are looking for deer that have been slowed for some reason, like in deep snow. <laughs> Maybe a, it's crusted on top so the wolves can run on top and they can, and they can get into these yard, uh, yarding areas or wintering areas where deer are and chase them around and some that are becoming weak because of starvation will be easy to catch and they can and they can catch them. Or out on a lake where our deer spend their winter, the wolves will chase deer out under the ice, bare ice, and the deer, if any of them lose their balance and fall down, they can't get up again. And they're easy prey for the wolves. But anyway, or if a wolf, if a deer is sick or old, you know, white-tailed bucks, when they're six and a half years old, that's generally their last year, and by their seventh winter, they're 
not the same animals they were before when they were in their prime. And I know of only one buck in our area that survived to age seven and a half. And all the rest were six and a half, and after that they were gone. They died. They wolves ate them in the winter. <laughs> well, there's a lot of reasons, you know, sick, wounded, that kind of thing. That's kind of deer uh, wolves look for when they're, when they're cruising in search of deer. Now these, these wolves, when, after they form pack, they start hunting a huge area. And I don't know how big it is. I've seen numbers like 100 square miles, and that's probably the way it works. A pack will hunt 100 square miles. And, and you think of, well, let's say, you know, an average forest area, there was probably going to be 15 deer per square mile, and there's 100 square miles. <laughs> that's 1,500 deer for them to uh, check over, and surely one or more of those are going to be slowed for some reason, and that's what they look for in the wintertime. But anyway, after that, I was so impressed by what those wolves did. You know, well, let me tell you, here come that doe. And when they came, it got to where I was, running like crazy, and the, and the alpha female behind them. The other six wolves came pouring out over in, a, in another direction, and they were too far away to actually be able to catch that running deer. Now, what had happened is I had goofed up their hunt. They had a drive-in stand going. That alpha female was chasing them, and those wolves were supposed to be centered directly downwind of where, it was, uh, where, the, where their selected prey was. And she was chasing them straight downwind, and they were supposed to be there, but they weren't there because I kind of told them, you can't be here, and they went so They were moving away at that moment. And, but they all went after that doe, and a few minutes later they came walking by, single file, going back in the direction that that doe and, and alpha uh, female came from, and uh, they obviously hadn't taken that deer. So I goofed them up there. Well, that was interesting. But it took a, some more time, and seeing something like this happen again, and finding tracks and snow that indicated that these wolves had done this. It hunted deer in this special way. Well, it was every now and then. You know, I spent a lot of time up there in spring and summer, as well as in the in the winter and during hunting seasons, fall, every season. My wife and I used to hook up our little travel trailer and go up there and spend a week or two in the woods, picking blueberries and things like that, checking on our deer and. Uh, and trying to see as much as we could of the wolves. And I remember one time uh, my son Dave and I were going up there together and, and we were just going to pull into this forestry trail. It's all almost scrolling over. You know, it hardly looks like a road anymore. And you get a lot of snow and everything's laying on the road and it's a mess. But that's all right. That's, that's, I prefer it that way. But we were pulling in there. It was uh, early fall. And here was the alpha female walking on the road just to where it would turn into where we might, where our camp area is located. And it just tried, it just walked in front of the truck. It was nowhere in. We had to slow down. And finally we said, we stopped the truck and got out. And it walked up a little ways and turned on to a trail. It goes up to a big tall hill on the right. And it was a walking up trail. We were kind of really curious about that. Her and, and we started up the trail a little bit, and she turned around and looked at us and said, "Yow!" <laughs> and we took it to be, but it, quit bugging me. I'm hunting here, <laughs> you know. And so, in one way, she 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 uh, spoke to us, and I spoke to them, and uh, and we seemed to understand one another. They seemed to be really intelligent animals, and at times I I shake my head and said, "No wonder." Wolves became the ancestors of all our pet dogs. There's something about them that makes them, I don't know, you know, we grow up thinking they're dangerous and there's something to be afraid of, but there's something about them that, that they, they just, they, they're curious about him. Oh, there's been times like one night we, the pack, the pack, we're real interested in a buck hanging behind our tent camp. 
and holy man were they making noise. They were howling and yapping and barking and it was at midnight. And finally uh, my son John decided he'd shoot a shot up into the air and they were even kind of afraid to open <laughs> the back door of the tent to take that shot, but they did. And it quieted them down for just a few minutes and pretty soon it started all over again. And finally we went out there and um, uh, a couple of guys loaded with their rifles and the other two of us getting that buck and stuffing into the, the back of my pickup under the topper on there, turning it off. So now it was safe from the wolves. And uh, then they went over a little ways or a little, little ledge not too far from camp and they sat there at maybe 100 feet, no, 100 yards I guess. And howled it. <laughs> we thought we'd never get to sleep that night, so we went out there and shot a couple more shots into the air, and they disappeared. Didn't see their their eyes shining in their flashlights anymore, and they went away. But but that was about the only time they weren't after the deer, not us. And I doubt that we, we were. There was any reason to believe we were in any danger from that wolf. First year I hunted there, I was, I took a buck at seven o'clock in the morning. And, and I was alone, and I was two miles from camp, long way, and we had 10 inches of new fallen snow on the ground. And after I only went about 100 feet, wolves were fighting with each other over the gut pile. And one of them wasn't doing well, it was doing a lot of yelping and yipping. <laughs> and then they kind of got quiet, and then I just kept going. I get, it was hard pulling that deer myself, a big buck, dominant breeding buck that was with the doe and heat. And I tell you, I, I thought, well, maybe they're not going to follow me after they've eaten that gut pile. That deer's going to be, you know, they'll be satisfied. But no, a little while later, <laughs> I heard them hauling behind me. They were definitely cl a lot closer than they were at that gut pile. And they, were, they were coming behind me. And this continued all day. And when, I, it, when it got dark, I still had a half mile to go to camp. And I remember I was on this hill, on this hill, and resting. I, I was just really wore out. This was really a tough <laughs> drag for one man. And really wore out, and I shined my flashlight, and here's all these glowing eyes back there. And they were coming toward me, they were getting closer. And that was one time I thought, I think I'm in danger here. <laughs> so I shot three times my 7 millimeter magnum, which I call Big Boomer because it, it makes a noise. I shot three times over their heads, you know, apply it. And they disappeared, all the glowing eyes disappeared. And remarkably, they didn't bother me off anymore all the way to camp. And I got to camp finally at 11 that evening. Every other time I've seen wolves in the woods where we hunt deer, I consider it good fortune. I mean, look at that beautiful animal. And they've demonstrated to me you know, all the willingness to avoid alarming me. <laughs> Except maybe when they were hungry a couple of times. That might, it might have been different. I don't know. But they are beautiful animals and you know, We've been there for 31 years now, <laughs> and I would be so disappointed if at night or in the evening, right at sunset, we didn't hear howling by those wolves. That's a typical time for them. And nowadays we hear howling in four other directions, more distant areas around us, a lot of wolves up there. Well, I'll tell you what's happened. Oh, after 45 years of being protected, well, there were a couple of years when they were unprotected here in Minnesota, and the first job of our, of our, the people in our state who are in charge of managing wolves and deer and such, they had to get wolf numbers reduced. That's not a lot, but at, just, and to see how that would affect deer numbers. Now, what's happened after 45 years, except for those two, our 
our deer numbers have gone at the best year. When we started there in 1990, we had 11 deer per square mile. I'm pretty sure back in the early 1960s, there was 22 per deer per square mile in this region. It was noted for lots of deer. Well, by 1911, we, when we went in there, and that was quite a bit after they became protected, their numbers were down to 11 per square mile. Today, we have five to six per square mile. And there are lots of areas in this region known as the, um, the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, all of northeastern Minnesota, big area north of Lake Superior. There's lots of areas, and there's only three, four deer per square mile. And we got a square mile in my study area where there's no deer, where there used to be lots of deer. And, um, but at, when you got all those wolves, they're going to eat a lot of deer, and they need those deer to survive. And that's what's been happening. Now, what's happening now is that, you know, our deer, our wolves used to hunt almost always at night time only. Now they hunt day and night. We are howling and chasing, excited barking and howling, chasing deer during daylight hours. Any hours of the day we hear them and they're moving around. Uh, they're doing a lot of things differently than they used to. Uh, and, but at any rate, when you have all these wolves doing this, they're going to reduce, num uh, reduce deer numbers. It's like, let's say you had a neighbor who raised cattle. And he had a great big pasture out there where he kept all his cattle, but he never killed any cattle. And they kept getting to be more and more, and pretty soon it was just bare dirt out there. Now, what would you think about a farmer who would love that to happen? Well, he'd probably want to have him arrested and thrown in jail and have all his cattle taken away from him, things like that. You hear that about horses and dogs and cats, and they have too many and they don't get fed. Well, that's what's happened now. Now there's so many wolves, they can't find enough food naturally. They spent a lot of time eating blueberries last summer to make up for the lack of medicine during summer months. And another thing has happened. Our packs, when we first started up there, were large. I mean, it was, there were packs up there, a dozen animals in that pack. Maybe a couple of them would be young pups, you know, half-grown wolves. In our area, 10 was pretty natural in those early years. I had 10 wolves in the pack, that's pretty impressive. You're sitting in the tree stand, here comes a file, they're going single file in front of you, all these big wolves. That's really impressive to see them. And you see the young pups in there, they're putting their noses in tracks and they're going along, they're all excited when they smell deer tracks. And you know, it's fun, but it's impressive. You think, oh man, I'm glad I'm in a tree. <laughs> well, anyway, there were a lot of wolves then. The packs were large. Today, since 2010, our packs have never numbered more than six total wolves. In fact, that only happened once. Since then, it's been four. Uh, my son Dave was up there oh, doing his last scouting uh, a few days ago, and there was snow on the ground up there. And he said, our pack now has three animals. Well, that's kind of early, but we had early snow and cold weather this year, and maybe the pack formed early this year. I was a little surprised by that. Or maybe it was the, the breeding pair that lives in our study area, and they have one pup, maybe. But that would be unique, too. But our packs have gotten down to be very small, like four to six animals. When you got only four in a pack, it's pretty hard for them to, even while they're hunting cooperatively, to take mature whitetails in the wintertime. And they were having a hard time. We had a deep snow back in, uh, what was the winter of, of 2092-93, hip deep snow up there. And that first pack we had, that first pair of wolves and the pack died that way. They disappeared. Uh, new wolves took over uh, two years later. We went a whole year without wolves in our area. But since then, they've been, you know, all this has been happening to them with their increasing numbers. Their packs have grown smaller because they're not getting enough to eat, and they have not had a pup since 2010. Not one pup, living pup, in the, you know, in November. We see the wolves, but we don't see any pups. We don't see any tracks of pups. We see two wolves, 
three wheels, four wheels, no smaller tracks of pups with them. So those are all symptoms of wolves that are not getting enough to eat. And so everyone who thinks it's just a cruel thing to kill wolves or reduce their numbers are just creating this situation where the, like the farmer who has too many cattle and there's nothing more for the cattle to eat. We're doing that with our wolves. And all the symptoms are there. You know, the increase in geographic range, the smaller wolf packs, uh, no pups, hunting during daylight hours, things like that. They're all saying, these poor wolves aren't getting enough. People who, who go to courts to try to keep uh, wolves from being reduced in number in Minnesota or anywhere else, are like those farmers who allow cattle to get to be so numerous they don't have any food left to eat. And that's what you've done to the wolves, and they have all the symptoms that show that's happening. But those people who do that, they don't live in the woods, they don't go out in the woods, they don't spend time in the woods, they don't see this happening. But it's happening. And that's cruelty. Much, much, it's much more cruel than reducing their numbers uh, humanely by hunting. And what, we, what the wolves and our deer need up there really badly is the wolves need to be reduced in numbers until uh, whitetails can start restoring their original numbers there. When, when you have whitetail numbers like between 15 and 22 per square mile up there, those wolves will have lots to eat. They won't have to pick on, on moose. We know they kill moose. Um, Moose reductions in northern Minnesota have been blamed on, on uh, brain worms, and whitetail have been blamed for that because they don't die from brain worms, so they're considered to be carriers, and then the moose get them and they die. Well, that's, that's wrong. But at any rate, uh, moose and deer will have a lot better life, and even grouse, by the way. Uh, our wolves key on drumming grouse in the spring like you wouldn't believe. But anyway, let's. We need to get a some kind of a balance between predator and prey. You know the old adage is when you have when you have too many predators, you have few prey, and vice versa. We got to get a balance there between the two. And you know our state deer and wolf managers are well uh, trained to achieve that balance. It's not something that can be done in any one day. But when we start to see deer numbers get back into, say, at least 15 per square mile, we'll know now we've got a nice balance. Wolves will have plenty to eat, and the deer will be able to uh, renew their numbers year after year, and it'll be a nice balance out there in the woods. But uh, to continue to allow wolves to be overabundant like they are today is so cruel to the wolves. I like wolves. I want them to be there forever. I want to hear their howls every year when I go deer hunting. I want my children and my grandchildren to, to, to hear those wolves howling as well. I think it's just wonderful to have. It's a sign of a true wilderness area up there. That, boy, you know you're in a wilderness. And I tell you, that is, it, it, you're so fortunate if you can hunt in an area where there are wolves and, and, and they aren't a danger to deer numbers or people or anything else like that. No. And, or to farm animals for that matter, livestock. When they have plenty of deer to eat, they aren't going to be near as much trouble as they could be. So it's time something is done about that. Now, day before yesterday, President Trump delisted Minnesota wolves. I think he got those that included Wisconsin and Upper Michigan, delisted those wolves from the Endangered Species Act which means at last, hopefully, good management will be able to bring back a good ratio of predator to prey in this area, which is would be good for the wolves and good for the deer, moose, and other creatures that live with wolves as well. And I hope that can happen. Now, you know, managing wildlife like deer and wolves is a big thing. I mean, that's a huge problem. And, and uh, us hunters play a prominent role in managing deer, you know. Every year, we've, we're volunteers. We spend our own money and our own time to help keep deer numbers within the carrying capacities of their ranges. 
what that means, to keep their numbers down so they don't starve in winter when, when food, when natural foods are, become scarce. If, if you got, you know, our whitetails can double a number in a single year under the right circumstances. And when they do that, there is no place in America today, no wintering, no place where they spend their winters that can support that many deer. There just isn't enough wild food for that many deer. And there probably never was. But it, it, it is wrong <laughs> to let that, you know, great numbers of deer to starve to death in the winter. And so us hunters, we, we, we do a great job of keeping that from happening. Well, wolf management is going to need our help as well. When one way or another, we'll be asked to do things. In fact, uh, I've been asked, and I'm going to do them, is to help in a project. Let me see, it's called uh, oh, Awful Wildlife <laughs> Watching. Watching awful, you mean gut piles of deer. We've been asked by uh, management here in this state to take photos of wolves feeding on gut piles of deer. Now, in the area we hunt, our wolves have been keying on our gunshots a lot. You know, during the winter months, a uh, lot of coming deer season, they aren't in our hunting area every day. Uh, they have this big area, and it takes them four days at least to, to travel through the whole area looking for a vulnerable deer to, to catch and eat. And uh, so, but when they're near, if they hear a gunshot from one of us, they key on that shot because they know at where that sound came from, they're going to find a gut pile that we leave behind after we field dress the deer and drag the deer away. And they make use of it. And boy, they can do that in a hurry. And I've had them do it, you know, before I went 100 steps from where I got piled that one year that I was telling you about. But we need to, what they need is photos of, of wolves on gut piles. It's kind of an important project. And, uh, and I, in fact, I went out the other day and bought a new trail cam. And a trail can that can do bursts, like one to three pitches, just click, 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 like that, uh, which is what they want. Uh, they, they apparently want you to do a, a, a burst of two photos, you know. And it's a trail can. You, t you take a deer, and it doesn't matter, buck or doe, you go out there and set up your trail cam to focus on that gut pile, those entrails, and uh, get it all set up and get pictures. And they want you to leave it out a certain while. I, I don't know how long to be sure, but I know those gut piles don't last long in our hunting area. They're gone within 24 hours usually. So they're just wiped off. <laughs> if what the wolves don't get, the ravens and the Canada jays and even little chickadees <laughs> get in there and get some of the fat that's found behind and which they need for the coming winter. So, but those piles are used and they're important to those animals living out there anyway. Fishers, oh man, fishers love them too. Well, anyway, I, I, you guys here in Minnesota, I wish you'd, you'd check on this. Yeah, you get on your computer and look up Opal Wildlife Watching on there. to get information about this project. And, uh, and, uh, and you'll find everything you need to know on there, and what you have to do, and how to set your camera, and all this kind of thing, and how to get your pictures, or whatever, to, the, to wherever they have to go for this study. But I think it would be wonderful. Just imagine, you can get some one-in-a-lifetime photos of wolves up real close by doing this. Something you might want to put on your wall, you know, have it in and frame it and put on your, all these wolves, you know, that'd be a nice, nice picture. So I think it'd be worth, really worth doing. And um, now, you, you'll see, I'll have this printed on the screen here, further information about it. Like if you have additional questions, you contact Alan at bell130 at umn at you. Well, you'll see that there. 
and, and then you you can then you can sign up to do this, and they have a sign up wizard there that you use, and and uh, get on that. Now you might find it all full already of other hunters down there, but um, but even if you do try it, I think that you get some nice pictures that way, and, and then let them know you have those pictures. They might want them. So uh, anyway, go to Ofo Wildlife Watching, and then. You'll, I'll give you this other information on the screen when we're done here, and do that. Because today, don't hate wolves. It's not their fault <laughs> that are in this bad situation. It's not their fault at all. And uh, let's get them out of it. Let's help them, help get them out of this bad situation. Let's help our state deer and wolf managers get that good ratio of predator prey going in this state. And from that time on, consider yourself just one of the luckiest hunters in the woods when you finally see a big timber wolf up close, now called gray wolves, of course. That, that's exciting, it really is. You'll, you'll never forget it, you know? So, let's do that, okay? You can miss other guys, get busy. You all got trail cams nowadays, so you can use your cam for that kind of thing during the hunting season. So, thanks a lot. For doing that, really, thank you very much, and because uh, I want you to help with wolf management, and it's good for wolves and good for deer and good for you. So, with that, uh, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll talk to you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account. My Amazon store with links to my ebooks. My son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. My website bookstore, and much more.